Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Preserving the Past and Fortifying the Future. I'm Carolyn Cauley, and I'm president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. I know we've got more than 600 of you tuned in today, and it's a real signal of how important this topic is. We're so pleased to host you for this program today. At the foundation, our mission is to educate the public on how business does well, does good, and prepares for the future. And so what you'll hear today is how that comes together and how it comes to life with historic preservation. We're gonna talk about how historic preservation benefits local economies and communities <clears throat> and neighborhoods. First, I'd like to tell you a short story about the United States Chamber of Commerce headquarters building here in Washington, DC. It's the place the foundation calls home. I wish we were there today, I would give you a tour, but for now, virtual photos will have to do. So if you're not from Washington, let me give you a sense of the place and where we are in the city. As you can see on this quick grab of a map, the red star is um, the US Chamber of Commerce headquarters. The circle immediately below is the White House. We are um, on an impressive piece of real estate in downtown Washington, facing the White House, facing Lafayette Park, and we're not far from the Supreme Court and the US Capitol building, which are the circles at the farther end. And what you see here is that the building is part of the city's historic face. In fact, it sits on the grounds of Daniel Webster's former home. And what I love about that is that the chamber decided not to just move into a gorgeous old building, but the place was built for purpose in 1922. At the urging of President Taft, to establish a national voice for business, which didn't exist at the time, local chambers of commerce from all across the country literally put money in a hat to build this building. And what you can see here on this next slide is a lovely old book. It's a log book of every contribution of every check that individuals wrote in the early 1900s. And this was when business was just crazy local. Um, if you could take a close look, you would see that the checks came from local towing companies and little banks and from farmers and small insurance agents, small chambers. And what they did when they wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, to build this building in the nation's capital facing the White House is they wanted to erect a building that showed their belief in the idea of representing business. And in the lobby today, there's an enormous bronze plaque naming the name of every small chamber that contributed. You can see this um, old historic photo here in black and white. And here it is today, the same plaque, same lobby, um, more better lit these days. Um, but visitors to the building love to see if their small town and their small chamber is listed on that plaque. Now, the name Cass Gilbert might be familiar to many of you. He was the renowned architect of the day, and he also designed the Supreme Court and the US Treasury Annex buildings. And his Chamber of Commerce building was named a national landmark in 1992. And you can see it here in this photo at the corner of 17th and H Streets downtown. Beginning last August, the US Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber Foundation began an 18 month restoration project to ensure that the building remains a landmark for the next 100 years and beyond. And feeling the weight of that history and its contributions to the local economy, we went to the National Trust for Historic Preservation for advice. And that resulted in just a really great partnership to ensure that the facade is cared for, and protected and restored in a sensitive and enduring way. And in fact, the, the Trust's Chief Preservation Officer, Catherine Malone France is here with us today. She's gonna to be the next speaker. So Catherine, thank you for your partnership and your leadership and your expertise. Your colleagues, Ross Bradford and Raina Reagan have been great partners to the Chamber team. Well, with the advice of the trust and many others, the chamber enlisted some of the best restoration experts in the business. And you can see some of their names and accomplishments here. I like to say that their resumes are literally carved in stone. 
and they brought those skills to repair the chamber's deteriorated cracked stone and original windows and other important work. They are true artists and the building is so lucky to be in their hands. So here are some photos of great work that's been happening. There was a lot of stone to clean um, and there was masonry to be repaired. You can see some up close photos here of, of some of the cracks and other damage that have been um, restored over the past several months. It's been really um, just inspiring to watch. And over the last 97 years, the US Chamber of Commerce has hosted just about every president, cabinet officials, administration officials, heads of state from all over the world, and of course, CEOs and business leaders. And in a typical year, about 65,000 people come through those doors to the common space at the chamber to talk about business and the economy and jobs. And when they do that, they're spending money and they're boosting the local economy. About 25 million visitors a year came to Washington last year in 2019. And tourism generated almost a billion dollars in tax revenue and supported 78, 80,000 jobs. And we know that just about every tourist who comes to Washington comes through our business district. We're in a great location and at the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Commerce Foundation, we care about jobs and we care about the economy and small businesses and local economies. It's what we do and so it's our privilege to contribute. We've got a terrific program today and our goal is that you'll walk away with a greater understanding of how historic preservation enhances real estate values, how it fosters local businesses and how it keeps historic main streets and downtowns economically viable and strong. Historic preservation is a tangible economic force. The money spent re rehabilitating historic buildings is an investment in the future because these structures become showpieces of a rejuvenated city and spaces for businesses to proper both existing businesses and, and new ones to come in the future. So we're joined today by some of the biggest thinkers and most accomplished people in this space, so to speak, for wide ranging conversations on the economic advantages of revitalizing and repurposing historic spaces. We're really delighted and privileged, privileged to be hosting this today. So let's get right to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Catherine, you are muted. I'm so sorry, is that better? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Catherine Malone France, uh, Chief Preservation Officer at the National Trust, and I'm I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon to, to talk about the, the value of preservation more broadly. I'm so sorry, but I see that something's gone wrong with my screen share. Hold on. I'm very sorry.
Is that visible? Okay, great. Um, so I'm delighted to be here to speak broadly about the value of historic preservation. And I wanna talk about that value, as I said, in the context of the powerful ways in which historic preservation is meeting our current moment. But I do wanna begin by thanking the US Chamber of Commerce, not just for developing and hosting this great program today, but also for being such wonderful preservationists. Uh, again, the National Trust is now honored to have been a part of the restoration work on the Chamber's headquarters, but also now to hold a preservation easement that will protect the exterior and some of the beautiful interior spaces of the headquarters in perpetuity. I'm sorry. So as we consider how preservation is meeting this moment, I think it's important to think about it in terms of the interconnected economic and cultural value of preservation, because I think in fact, it is in that alchemy of preservation's cultural and economic impacts that it is truly a transformative force in our community. At the risk of, of stating the, the obvious, um, we are in a moment of, that is marked by tremendous and intertwined challenges. And historic preservation is meeting this moment because our work strengthens communities in ways that are as interconnected as the challenges we face. And I want to highlight just a few examples of this. The interconnected benefits of preservation are at the very heart of a new report that we released just two weeks ago as a part of the work of our African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, which also includes a national grant program and work with historic sites around the country. With support from the Ford Foundation and the JPB Foundation, the report asks a critical question. How can preservation be a force for advancing equitable development and social justice in African-American neighborhoods and other communities of color. In order to fully realize preservation's potential, we have to answer this question with openness to understand and acknowledge our role in perpetuating systems of inequity and to address these issues head on. We also have to engage in inclusive decision-making and make changes to the regulatory frameworks that currently prevent the benefits of preservation from extending to all communities. This report, and you see its key components here, seeks to support conversations, exchanges of best practices, and new research and demonstration projects that are needed across the field of preservation. Please download it at savingplaces.org and let us know what you think. As the case studies in the report demonstrate, preservation can and should empower communities to preserve their distinctive places and legacies in ways that shape more equitable outcomes in terms of economic prosperity and cultural representation. Another example of the interconnected benefits of preservation is certainly found in the potent combination of historic tax credits and new market tax credits. Our colleagues at the National Trust Community Investment Corporation are deeply engaged in this work, having invested over $500 million in adaptive reuse projects in some of our nation's most economically distressed communities. With their newly awarded $50 million allocation in new markets credits, NTCIC is committed to the principles you see here. These principles ensure that preservation doesn't just create economic returns, it creates community serving ones as well, including new jobs that provide access to living wages to individuals who have lower incomes and fewer skills. These are projects like the adaptive reuse of the former Niagara machine and tool works as the Northland Workplace Workforce Training Center in Buffalo, where students like these who you see here are now trained for 21st century manufacturing jobs. 
The interconnected benefits of preservation are also vividly on display on Main Street commercial districts in cities and small towns all across this country. You're gonna hear more about the great work of Main Street a little bit later on a panel, but Main, the National Main Street Center, we are so proud, is a subsidiary of the National Trust. The Main Street approach combines the rehabilitation of commercial corridors and buildings with initiatives that spur entrepreneurship, fill vacant storefronts, and create thriving local economies. Since 1980, Main Street programs have generated over 295,000 building rehabilitations, 150,000 new businesses, and 670,000 new jobs. But the Main Street approach and the Main Street program has also extended the legacies of these historic commercial districts forward, allowing them to evolve while defining themselves and redefining themselves as places of community pride, creativity, innovation, and connectedness. Sorry, let me go back. The cultural and economic resilience that the National Main Street Center and Main Street organizations all across the country have supported in commercial districts for 40 years is serving them well in this moment and serving all of our communities very well. But please do join us as we continue and Main Street leads the effort to bring more support to these communities and to the Main Street programs that support them. But I want to return to my original charge uh, today, which was really to speak broadly about the cultural benefits of preservation. And I want to do so as I think in this challenging moment, you know, if I had to sum up the cultural benefits of historic preservation in three words, they would be truth, hope, and unity. Historic places tell us the truth about ourselves. One of the sites on the National Trust's 11 most endangered historic places list this year was the Harada House in Riverside, California. It's a relatively ordinary house, and it was home to Jukichi and Ken Harada, who owned a restaurant there in Riverside. Eventually, they had to fight for their own right to own the property as immigrants and ultimately won a landmark court decision in the early 20th century. But if you want just one reason to preserve the Harada House, it is this. In the spring of 1942, the Harada's teenage son, Harold, scrawled a simple, poignant message on the wall upstairs that is still readable today, recording his family's removal to the internment camp. You see it here, evacuated on May 23rd, 1942, Saturday, 7 a.m. Harold's parents died in the camps and Harold went on to serve in Europe as a part of the 442nd Infantry Regiment of American soldiers of Japanese ancestry. Harada House embodies the profound strength of the human spirit, even in the face of systemic racism and disenfranchisement. Preserving places like the Harada House helps us write a truer national narrative that is ultimately a firmer foundation for our shared values, identity, and progress. And it's only with the acknowledgement of truths like those told by the Harada House that we can move on to the important work of repair and reconciliation. Historic preservation is also about hope. In fact, it is inherently hopeful work. It's about the future, and it's about bringing places back to life for that future. Tomorrow night, as a part of Pass Forward, which is our national preservation conference happening right now, three incredible projects will be recognized with the prestigious Richard H. Driehaus Preservation Awards. They each demonstrate how preservation is bringing hope to communities right now. The Fowler Clark Epstein Farm in Boston, Massachusetts is a rare surviving federal period farmstead that was threatened by demolition with demolition by neglect. But Historic Boston Incorporated purchased the property in the heavily disinvested Mattapan neighborhood in 2015, and in partnership with the Irving Farm, Urban Farming Institute, the Trust for Public Land, and the North Bennett Street School, they've realized a vision for this place that has increased food access, created new green space, and provided opportunities for neighborhood residents to engage in agriculture and the preservation trades. 
The Chelsea District Health Center in New York City is one of 14 New Deal era district health centers created almost a century ago to bring care to underserved communities, and it's been updated into a state-of-the-art medical facility. With great intention and funding from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the design preserved the building's beautiful architecture and its park-like setting, but it returned but it also created a welcoming and reassuring space for healthcare at a moment when that is so important. And lastly, the Universal Life Insurance Company building. It's a landmark Egyptian revival building in Memphis, Tennessee, designed in 1947 by the renowned African-American architecture firm McKissick and McKissick. Its original, its original owner was the Universal Life Insurance Company established in 1923 and by 1973 was the largest black owned business in Memphis and the fourth largest black owned insurance firm in the country. Today, through an innovative public partnership, the rehabilitated building now houses a black owned architecture firm, Self and Tucker Architects, and the city's Office of Business Diversity Compliance. The truth of historic places and the hopeful work of preserving them comes together in unity. How we recognize and take care of historic places is a tangible demonstration of our respect for each other's heritage, accomplishments, and value. In a survey that was conducted in August by Stephen Rasmussen, 93% of American voters said they believe it's important for our leaders to focus on things that bring people together. Perhaps preservation's greatest value in this moment is that it has the power to unite us. I hope all of the projects and the initiatives that I've talked about here vividly demonstrate that preservation is work that brings us together and binds us together in deeply meaningful and interconnected ways. You know, we often talk about how we save these places, but I think it's important to remember with some humility that time and time again, historic places save us right back. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here and we're just thrilled uh, that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has hosted this event, uh, and it really speaks to the enlightenment of the of Chamber of Commerce Foundation that a huge economic contribution that uh, historic preservation uh, generates. So whenever the slides can click on. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the work that we do. I have a small firm called Place Economics, and much of the work we do is in evaluating the impacts of historic preservation. We have great clients, uh, and nearly always they agree that once they receive the report for us to, uh, to put it on our website. Uh, so if I'm going to take factoids from a bunch of these uh, studies, uh, but please feel free to go to our website and download so you can get the whole picture. Next one, please. So what I want to do is talk about uh, eight or ten of the kinds of contributions, economic contributions that historic preservation makes. Next one, please. Uh, as the Chamber of Commerce will tell you that at the heart of it, uh, economic development about jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, and and what's true about historic preservation, about the rehabilitation of historic buildings, is it is an extraordinarily strong job-creating activity. A few years ago, we did an assignment to look at the impact of the state historic tax credit in Louisiana. Eight hundred and twenty-one projects, two point seven billion dollars uh, generated, and every year, seventeen hundred. On average, 1,700 direct jobs and another 1,400 indirect jobs came out of that rehabilitation. That's real economic development. Every year, those jobs have paychecks and over $100 million on average of paychecks to Louisiana citizens rehabilitating the buildings that used the tax credit and more jobs more labor income, and more impact on other uh, activities than new construction. Issue about uh, 
uh, jobs in rehabilitation, they have a huge local impact because of their labor intensity. Uh, next slide, please. So it's not, it's not that we don't have to have new construction, of course. Of course we do, but in terms of the impact on the local economy, when you when you build a new building, for every hundred jobs that are created in new construction, there's another 135 jobs elsewhere in the economy, and that's great. But for every hundred jobs in rehabilitation, there's a creation of 186 jobs elsewhere in the economy. Every time a new building is built. Every $100 is in some uh, worker's paycheck. It uh, generates $145 of labor income elsewhere in the economy. But you pay a, a worker on rehabilitation $100, and ultimately there's another $174 in additional labor income elsewhere in the economy. It's this huge uh, spinning off, impacting uh, economic activity. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide, please. So the second area, and, and it, was, it was mentioned, is this issue of downtown revitalization, where historic preservation through Main Street and otherwise has had a huge impact. Next slide, please. It's probably a lag between the Chamber of Commerce, which is eight blocks from where I live in this screen. Next slide, please. Uh, we recently uh, did a study of 40 years of, uh, back up a couple, please. We did a study of a program in North Carolina, one of the great uh, Main Street programs in the country. Uh, and over the 40 years of that program, in mostly small towns uh, throughout uh, North Carolina, uh, $3.5 billion of investment well over half of which came from the uh, private sector, investing in small towns uh, throughout North Carolina. Can you go back a slide, please? Uh, separate from the Main Street uh, study, we did a study in the city of Raleigh a few years ago, uh, and then go forward to, um, and Raleigh, you know, state capital in the midst of the research triangle, uh, an aggressive progressive city, lots of activity in the downtown. That's the one thank you. Uh, so lots happening, including lots of new construction. But we, well, almost half of them, in fact, moved into historic buildings in the downtown. And another 20%, in fact, older buildings that just hadn't been uh, designated yet. Uh, we always try to look for new ways to look at preservation's impact. So we looked at Yelp and said, what are the most popular restaurants on Yelp? Well, of the top 20, in fact, nearly half of them are located in historic buildings. Next slide, please. Which is really saying there's not just the food that you're getting, it's the atmosphere that's created when you choose a restaurant, uh, and historic preservation adds to that one. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, the kind of default response when you say economics and historic preservation single sentence is, oh, you must mean heritage tourism. And it certainly one of them. Next slide, please. And when you, you're a tourist, basically all of your money goes into five areas. Goes in your hotel, goes for transportation within the place you're traveling to. It goes to retail purchases, and then it goes to admissions, recreations, uh, and so forth. Well, we looked in San Antonio, uh, big visitation there. And in every one of those categories, Categories. In fact, more money was spent by heritage visitors in each of those five categories than tourists in general. Here's Pittsburgh. Of course, uh, San Antonio it has the Alamo. It's now a World Heritage Site. You expect them there. What about Pittsburgh? It might not leap into mind as a heritage tourism place, but every year, over $800 million is spent in the city of Pittsburgh by heritage, not all tourists, by heritage visitors to Pittsburgh. Next one, please. And one more, please. So property values. And a really interesting uh, issue on property values is it's an area we've looked at for uh, 30 years. Uh, and we used to hear when when we'd say, oh, we're on a local historic district, that there would be resistance of people saying, oh, no, that means one more layer of regulation. Next slide, please. Um, 
And then once more, click it once more, please. Uh, that's going to hurt property values. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to go through another hoop. Well, we've now looked in dozens of cities around the world. In fact, the opposite has been true. So this is uh, Savannah. And look at the time frame, 1999 to 2014, and think about the real estate economy over that time. It was kind of going up at a crazy pace and then a big crash and then a gen, uh, gen, uh, general recovery. Uh, and this is Savannah over those three cycles in the real estate industry. Every single one of the local historic districts, in fact, outperformed Savannah as a whole in terms of change in value over that time. Now, some of these neighborhoods in Savannah are really rich. Some of them are the opposite of rich. Didn't matter. Every one of them outperformed uh, the marketplace. Next slide, please. Uh, but sometimes there's been some pushback on this whole property values thing because they say, well, yeah, that helps the people who, who own properties in historic district, but what about the rest of us? A lot argue it makes a big deal for the rest of us in that most local governments in the United States, local governments being school districts, county and city government, uh, highly based on the value of the property. So in Savannah, we looked at what we call the preservation premium the extra amount of property value attributable to being in a historic district, not the whole, whole value of the historic property or the amount of appreciation, just the amount of appreciation greater than the rest of the city. That preservation premium, the taxes on that preservation dollars a year, and about three million each to the city and the county. Well, what can they pay? The salaries of eighty-six teachers. The county could pay a quarter of the budget of the entire sheriff's office, and the city, if they chose to do it, could subsidize almost thirteen hundred families with a two hundred dollar per month rental subsidy forever. So the beneficiaries happen to own those properties. Next two slides, please. And one more. Uh, one area that people need to be paying attention to, and that is this issue of foreclosures. We've now looked at 30 or 35 cities around the country, all regions, all sizes of city, uh, with this same answer, is that in the depths of the real estate recession, the rates of appreciation of, of, of foreclosures in historic districts was uh, decidedly lower than the city. Here was a study we did in Miami-Dade County. And we looked at the five incorporated cities within Dade County that had local historic districts and looked at their uh, foreclosure rates in every single instance. The foreclosure rate was less than it was in the county as a whole. Next slide, please. Uh, and here it is in Pittsburgh, where uh, you 35 out of a thousand thousand households in Pittsburgh during the height of the recession, in fact, faced a foreclosure uh, action. Uh, in National Register District, the rate was a third of that, and the local districts even less. Now, it's not that nobody who lives in historic district ever loses their job, or is that even in weak markets, there, there's a sufficient latent demand for properties in historic districts that if I get myself in financial trouble, I can get out of it before I move in to uh, the foreclosure. Uh, next step. Next slide, please. And actually, you can go two slides. Next one. Now, one of the things about the Chamber of Commerce, I, I know that the Chamber of Commerce have some giant corporations as members, but why I've always loved the Chamber of Commerce is they care about us little guys. They like little businesses. And there is this preference shown wherever we've looked of small businesses being in historic districts. So Nashville, great, another great, vibrant local economy. The historic districts in uh, Nashville only include 3% of all the jobs in Nashville, but 11% of the job growth took place in those historic districts, 13% of startup jobs in those historic districts, 15% of small business jobs in historic districts. Next slide, please. Uh, in economics, There's a geeky term called revealed preference, and that is you see what people prefer based on where they're expensive for small businesses being in a historic district. Next slide, please. Here is uh, San Antonio. 
Uh, and the purple areas are local historic districts in San Antonio. The green circles are concentration of jobs in small businesses. And again, it's not that every small business is in the historic district, but there there's extraordinary pattern of being in or close to. It's this drawing, this character attraction of those uh, historic neighborhoods that, in fact, uh, small business people are disproportionately looking for. Next slide, please. Next two slides. Uh, one more. So we all know about these issues about the knowledge uh, workers and creative class workers. Uh, and again, this is an area where we've looked at cities all over. Here is uh, Indianapolis on knowledge workers. So 3%, the 3% of the land area, three and a half percent of Indianapolis is an historic district, 16% of the jobs, but 28% of these knowledge worker jobs, those in the professional scientific and technical services disproportionately choosing historic districts. Next one, please or pattern in the creative class workers. Many of you have uh, read uh, Richard Florida about the creative class and it might be overrated some places. And you may love or you may hate New York City, but nobody can argue that it's not one of the most creative cities in the world. So we looked at where these creative class workers are. And in Manhattan, where are the historic districts uh, and encompass 12 and a half percent of the jo of all jobs, 23 percent of these creative class workers are in jobs in the historic districts. Even when you take the whole city of all five boroughs, the whole city of New York, that historic districts are eight and a half percent of the jobs, but 19%, almost 20% of these creative class workers. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Uh, and one more. Uh, here's the, the environment. And again, that might be economics once removed, uh, but it's where historic buildings really make a huge contribution. So when Bloomberg was mayor, when he was going out of mayor of the city of New York, good businessman that he is, he said, I want to put New York on the path to be the most uh, energy efficient city in the world. And good businessman that he was said, first thing we have to do is to say, well, who's using the energy now? And so he ordered that's continued since he left office, an annual audit, energy audit of tens of thousands of buildings. And what they found was, lo and behold, it's not those old buildings that are energy hogs. The older the building, the less energy consumption there was. In fact, a multifamily building than one built a century ago. Next one, please. A few years ago, to apply uh, environmental measures, next slide, please, uh, to uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and so we've just stole methodology and used it uh, whenever possible. And what we've found is that on all the environmental measures, in fact, it's much more environmentally responsible to rehab an existing building uh, than to build new. And then the issue of, next slide, of density at a human scale. Again, often times preservation gets criticized saying, oh, we have those historic districts and we need density in our city and you're keeping density from happening. Well, again, we look at this issue every place and here's a low density city relative to the many places, Los Angeles. Well, in fact, the density in historic districts is almost twice of that of the rest of the city. It's dense, not just density, it's density at a human scale. Next one, please. Uh, and that the opposite from Los Angeles is uh, New York City. And class, one of the densest cities. Well, in fact, uh, the, among the densest places in each of the five boroughs is the historic district. In fact, uh, over 90% of historic districts in New York have a density greater than the city is. And of the low density areas in New York City, 99% uh, of low density areas are not in historic district. 1% of the historic uh, low density areas in historic district. So if there's something preventing density in New York, it absolutely unequivocally is not. It's historic district. Next slide, a couple more.
Two more slides. Almost done. One more. Two more. Maybe all the political talk in Washington has slowed down the internet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the issue is, is that uh, historic preservation not antithetical to economics or economic development. In fact, it's an effective tool through which economic can take, uh, can take place. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation for uh, hosting this event and inviting uh, me to participate. Uh, so my name is R.J. Walney. I am the uh, 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 Senior Vice President of Corporate Development at Bedrock in Detroit. Bedrock is the real estate uh, investment arm of uh, Dan Gilbert, the founder of Quicken Loans. Uh, you may now know it as, as Rocket Mortgage. Um, and we have quite a bit underway in, in both Detroit and, and Cleveland. Um, so with that, I, I'm going to uh, give a bit of a, a background and, and glimpse into what we have underway uh, in Detroit and Cleveland, uh, hitting on a number of the themes actually that have already been mentioned uh, here uh, this afternoon. So um, to, uh, to quickly take it away, uh, just a bit about Bedrock. Uh, so we are a uh, really a full service uh, real estate company, everything from acquisitions and construction and development to leasing and property management, activation of public spaces, um, and, uh, and again, really from the full life cycle of identifying opportunities in our, in our urban cores in particular, um, all the way to through, through operations and activation. Um, so our mission, uh, as I was mentioning, really is transforming urban cores by creating unique experiences through real estate. And uh, that word unique is, is very, very important uh, for a number of reasons, but relative to our discussion today, um, you know, we really look at uh, the authenticity that historic structures bring and historic districts and historic areas bring as truly creating those unique, uh, those unique experiences that can't be recreated uh, today necessarily. So when we think about our urban uh, investment and catalytic development work, um, it is quite synonymous actually with, with historic uh, uh, preservation. Uh, so when we think about urban core revitalization, we do uh, really look to, to take action in a number of different verticals. So whether that's uh, attraction of workforce and, and office tenants, uh, ground floor activation in retail restaurants and, and hospitality, offering quality uh, uh, living uh, options uh, for residents, for residents uh, either current or att uh, attracted residents to, to our urban cores. Again, the activation of public spaces, those, those interstitial spaces that connect the various uh, buildings and structures that we that we own together and to create common gathering places for people to enjoy uh, those historic uh, neighborhoods and districts uh, that we are active in every day. And then of course, mobility, uh, connecting them all, uh, giving people ways to access uh, the, the experiences that, that we create. Um, so to put uh, just some numbers to that, we have uh, committed $5.6 billion of investment in, since 2011, since the founding of our company in Detroit and Cleveland. We've acquired over 115 properties and we own more than 18 million square feet uh, in those two cities. Uh, we have attracted over uh, 500, or have over 500 commercial and office tenants in our De uh, Detroit central business district in particular. Um, so while the growth of our parent company, Quicken Loans, or now Rocket Mortgage, has been a big piece of the story uh, to, to Detroit and Cleveland, uh, we have also attracted a number of tenants uh, and large job creators uh, alongside us as well, creating uh, op jobs and opportunity and great further follow-on investment. Uh, so to give just a bit of orientation, so again, Detroit is, is our hometown. Uh, we are our largest presence, presence there. Uh, we are also very active in Cleveland as well, but I'm going to fo focus a little bit more on, on Detroit. So uh, Detroit, um, as you as you may, may, may know, uh, zooming in a little bit further, uh, 
Detroit in and of itself is a very large city. It's 139 square miles, um, which makes presents some, some unique uh, challenges and opportunities in and of itself. Um, the area, if you uh, read a, a story uh, of, sort of over recent history about uh, in, uh, attraction of investment and activity, um, the downtown uh, area of uh, the Central Business District, Midtown, and some surrounding neighborhoods um, have been uh, the most positively af affected by, by that activity over the course of the past handful of years. Um, but we are working very diligently to figure out how best to and to create those connections um, to more outlying neighborhoods and create uh, greater opportunity and access and investment in those, those parts of the city as well. That is a 7.2 square mile area. The central business district, which is in the center of that, where we are most uh, active uh, in our work is one and a half square miles. So re relatively dense uh, and small, small footprint, but uh, quite a lot to tackle there nonetheless. Um, and so despite the challenges that Detroit has faced over the you know, past few decades, frankly, um, what uh, PwC did a study in 2016 in its Emerging Trends in Real Estate report identifying um, that Detroit actually had the second largest increase in market outlook over a, that six year period from 2010 to 2016, taking into a number of, of factors about, um, again, investment opportunity in, in that city. Um, and that's important to mention that that is uh, in the midst of you know, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the country in 2000, mid 2013, um, which thankfully we were able to uh, work through very, very quickly and emerge, merge from um, you know, stronger than, than certainly we went into it. Um, but that increase in, in market outlook uh, over that period of time um, you know, had, had that very large impactful event uh, in, in the midst of it as well. Um, so, you know, again, we have uh, a, a large, a large population in the city, uh, 150,000 uh, uh, people in downtown uh, daytime population, which we look to serve the needs of, but also, again, attract more people to work and live and play in the city. Um, and so, you know, as a result of that, the narrative uh, has been evolving pretty dramatically about the prospect of what's going on in, in Detroit. And it, it, again, we've been doing that uh, through the acquisition and rehab of historic buildings. Um, and and also ground up construction to complement that, but but uh, certainly an early focus on on bringing back to life and bringing back to the former glory um, these beautiful historic buildings. This is uh, the first national building um, in the center of our downtown, one of our early early acquisitions. It's serving as a centerpiece. I just want to focus really quickly on one massive project uh, that we have underway, which is our book development project. So this this is the book tower on the left hand side of the uh, the, the image. Um, this Italian Renaissance building um, began construction in 1916, was finished in 1926. Uh, there was actually supposed to be, so that's a 36 story tower. There was supposed to be an 81 story tower on the further left side of that, uh, of that page, but uh, the Great Depression unfortunately uh, uh, mothballed that plan. Um, we actually acquired this building in 2015 and have been rehabbing it uh, ever since. Um, it is a massive, massive undertaking. We've been working, had been working on the exterior for, for over three years, um, just, just bringing it back to, uh, to, to life and cleaning it up um, since really the, the 70s uh, until we acquired it, it had gone in through disrepair and dis, disinvestment and ultimately uh, being vacant. Um, and this uh, image here on the screen just shows to the extent, um, you know, the cleanup and, and, and improvement and renovation of the building underway. So this will ultimately be uh, actually a $300 million um, renovation of this massive, massive building, about 500,000 square feet in total, um, and in, is really in keeping with our approach to uh, investing in place, uh, investing in, 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 in people to bring, uh, again, economic opportunity and job creation, and really a human, a, a a human capital attraction thesis that we're executing in, in Detroit and Cleveland. Um, so as I was mentioning, the investment in our urban core really has has, has centered around create walkable urban development, catalytic and transformative uh, investment to our downtown, uh, hinging off of uh, that historic renovation. Um, our company in and of itself, again, the rock, uh, Rocket family of companies, uh, Quicken Loans, as you might know it, um, has been incredibly impactful in, in, our, in our cities and Detroit in particular. We have 18,000 team members in downtown today uh, from initially moving uh, 1,500 employees uh, back in, in 2010. 
Uh, and over that period of time uh, from 2010 to 2016, we had invested $8 billion. Uh, and so we, we actually undertook a study with George Washington University uh, to understand our economic impact for the state and city. And uh, what we found was that our investment in, uh, caused just shy of $18 billion of statewide economic impact. And $5 billion of that was, was wage increases. And we were able to trace back our very, very um, catalytic and massive investments in our, in our cities causing a wage increase for, for private sector employees, ultimately for the purpose, again, of attracting talent uh, and that knowledge economy that was referenced uh, in, in uh, prior speakers' uh, 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 remarks. And so we, uh, again, we have uh, some, great, uh, some great talent already in the region uh, being attracted to an incredible university and college system. And so we want to create these authentic places, create this vibrant core, vibrant downtown core, to uh, to attract and to retain that amazing talent uh, for the you know really the jobs of, of the future and, and the knowledge economy that's uh, been referenced so frequently. Um, so with that, uh, we're uh, you know we're, we're, our our activity is underway. It's proving to be quite successful, and yet in some respects we're really just getting started. Um, so uh, when times return to normal and we're able to move around uh, in person, I, I would encourage all of you to come come visit us in, in Detroit. And uh, and thank you again for for having me today. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Carney. It's a real pleasure to participate in this important conversation. My job is focused on the future, which requires me to spend a lot of time thinking about the past. So that's what we're gonna do for the last few minutes of this program. Alex Weld is gonna join us from Wheeling, West Virginia. Why Wheeling? Well, here's an excerpt from something I read about her city. Located along the Ohio River, Wheeling experienced significant disinvestment in the 1980s and 90s as retailers went to suburban shopping malls and major local industries suffered losses. When Wheeling's Main Street program launched in 2015, their downtown's vacancy rate stood at 32%. Now, after generating nearly $50 million in total investment downtown, the vacancy rate has decreased to 15% and 124 buildings have seen improvements. Historic preservation has played an important role in the revitalization of Wheeling, so we can't think of anyone better to talk about ways to fortify the future by preserving the past than someone from Wheeling. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here, and thanks for, the, um, for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about a really great little city in West Virginia. It's our pleasure. Uh, so Wheeling has won awards for its preservation-focused Main Street revitalization. Can you walk us through the transformation? And yeah. The so you know, as you mentioned, played. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, um, you know, disinvestment was um, all over all over the city, particularly in downtown, which is our main focus area. Um, and so a lot of the um, a lot of the historic buildings in in the historic district of downtown were vacant. Um, and so. We, we tackle that in several ways, one of which is we've expanded the historic district to make sure that people that are looking at rehabilitating these buildings um, can do so with historic tax credits. We worked at the state level um, with the legislature um, doing a lot of advocacy work to increase the historic tax credit, um, which we have we have a very high one in West Virginia at 25 percent, um, with, coupled with federal um, incentives, really, really make deals work now when they didn't before with historic properties. Um, and, um, you know, overall, we've seen this huge shift. We've been working with entrepreneurs to help them get ready to go into historic properties um, with, with some training skills and things like that. So by, by kind of bridging those two things, we've really been able to see an exciting transformation of our downtown. So your group describes itself as a catalyst for the revitalization of Wheeling. Why is historic preservation so important to town, to the, to the economic future of towns and cities like yours? So I'm sure we've all heard the Jane Jacobs quote, um, new ideas need old buildings, which is, um, you know, I just, I feel like our organization's a walking billboard for that quote because um, the old buildings in, in our community are what's, what are supporting 
um, the future of Wheeling. So, you know, all of us have seen several buildings torn down and any community you've been in, you, you have seen a building torn down and you've said, I cannot believe they tore that down. And most of that is demolition by neglect, right? Several, for several years, buildings have sat vacant, they've started to collapse and there was really no other option. Um, and so we're lucky in Wheeling that we kind of were able to jump in at the right time um, and say, let's get eyes on some of these properties to ensure that that, that doesn't happen. So, um, you know, whether that meant working with like some technical assistance work, we brought in um, a state architect to, as through our Main Street program, we have services with an architect to come in and pair up with building owners to do some renderings and feasibility and reuse um, and kind of walk people through that process. Um, and, you know, several other little things back to the entrepreneur thing, trying to get people ready. But if these buildings weren't around and they, you know, if, you know, 10 years for 10 years ago or eight years ago, we said, it's not worth it. We're just going to go ahead and, you know, let these buildings fall into disrepair and not fight for their future. Um, we would be seeing vacant blocks that may or may not have some, you know, strange looking structures popping up on them. They probably would not be um, contextual to the area. We, you'd have some vacant empty buildings alongside, um, you know, historic buildings alongside new kind of big boxy looking lifeless buildings and the sense of place would be completely gone and that does not attract anyone when you think of a, a downtown that is lively and exciting and interesting to walk through and to be a part of you don't think of like a strip mall atmosphere typically and so we wanted to incentivize redevelopment of these historic properties to ensure that we didn't become anywhere usa we really wanted to be grounded in wheeling and what that looked like th with our heritage so when we talk about heritage, whose who's heritage are we talking about? And, and how do you choose which eras are worthy of historic preservation? Yeah, so there are a couple um, ways to look at that. One is, um, you know, per like state, state historic guidelines, um, 50 years is historically significant. So sometimes that is really based on the area in which a building sits. So in our downtown, for instance, um, there are certain spots that, you know, maybe in the 50s, a facade or a building's um, current architecture is historically significant because when you look at the overall picture of a downtown, it fits in, right? The context of that building makes sense based on where you are and the story that the, this architecture is telling you. Um, so every once in a while, a building has been redone in the 50s and all of the other buildings around it are 1890s. And that that building, most likely architects and, and historic pre preservation specialists would say, this is not historically significant to this district. So it could, it could be um, kind of taken back to that older facade and you would not you would not need to keep that 1950s facade so really it's it's kind of contextual you take a step back and look at the story um, a district or a certain block or a certain section of downtown is telling you so when we were talking the other day you made a really important point you said that you know preservation is a way to drive economic growth but in many cases preservation is not the end objective uh, it's just a tool for economic revitalization that produces some significant value for the community and for the people who live in the community. Can you talk to us about how those pieces fit together in Wheeling? And then, you know, we have people joining us today from all over the country. Are there lessons that they can learn from your experiences as they look at both the, the twin challenges of historic preservation and economic growth or revitalization? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So as you mentioned, I, I believe the two go hand in hand and I think we're a great case for that. Um, I think that in, in downtowns all across the country, this is kind of something that someone could take away, um, which is that sometimes preservation for preservation's sake is important. Um, however, most of the time, um, people involved in a project or people you'd hope would be involved in a project will not be involved in it for that reason. They are involved in it because they're developers, they are business owners, um, they are someone who is looking to be financially profitable or to have um, a space that's financially viable. and you know, every once in a while, that means a property can't work. You know, if, if a property is beyond repair, sometimes that really does happen and it needs to be torn down. And a lot of preservationists hate to admit that, but that's 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 reality. So, um, you know, obviously there are several things that need to be done to, to prevent demolition by neglect. Um, 
which can take place at the city level um, and other levels as well. But we, we work primarily on the city level to ensure there, there are ordinances and things that are kept up with so demolition by neglect doesn't happen. So that's one very easy way to prevent that. Um, uh, what else? Um, there are several there are several things I think that um, we've done to ensure that these buildings are profitable and do make sense financially, right? Because um, at the end of the day, you can have a beautifully hi historically accurate, wonderful building, but if it doesn't fit your downtown or if it doesn't fit your community or there's no there's no planned end use for it, that brings no dollars, no tax dollars, no tourism dollars into your community. So we've been, um, you know, firm believers of new ideas need old buildings. If you don't have an idea for a building and you don't have, the building doesn't have um, the means in which to provide more back to your community, then it's kind of, it kind of doesn't, doesn't really add up. So, um, you know, we, we solely, I would say, focus more on the, on the reuse side versus the preservation for preservation sake side. Um, and, you know, you can, you can help, you can help developers and help people get to that point um, of seeing the worth of a building. Sometimes that's a lot of pre-development work. That's having an architect come in and do um, end use planning, do a general assessment of the property and what that what it would kind of take maybe to white box or mothball it or to get it completely historically rehabbed. And then we you can even build pro formas using historic tax credits and others, opportunity zones, new markets, whatever, whatever your district may um, resources may be available for you to to make the case for a financial um, a financial win with historic preservation. So there are several things um, we can do to kind of bolster that for people and get them there, right? So we can we can make those possibilities make sense, pen to paper, and make um, make historic preservation um, financially viable for for people in our community and for developers. And quickly, I, you know, what you're saying, it sounds like it would be music to the ears of the business community beyond developers. Is that is that accurate? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, when you think of the floor plate of several old buildings, a lot of them are these historic storefronts that are the exact right size for small business owners. Um, so we've worked with small business owners um, through some entrepreneur training programs and some other community um, directed funding programs to ensure that they have the tools they need to be successful. So um, whether they're developing the building themselves, which we've had, or whether a building is redeveloped looking for a business to move into them, um, we've been able to pair those those people up with the right businesses to ensure that those buildings are back into productive reuse. Well, thanks a lot, Alex. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk about all the learnings from your experiences in Wheeling and wish you and the rest of the folks in that community good luck as you continue to try and preserve the past. Uh, and thank you to all of our guests. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. We hope you all found something valuable and rewarding to take away from this important conversation. Uh, we certainly did. Uh, in fact, we're so committed to this topic that we've decided to do another event. This one focused on the role of preservation plays in creating a sense of place that enables communities, cultures, and commerce. We'll let you know when that's scheduled. Uh, in the meantime, uh, be well, wear a mask, get a flu shot, and stay healthy. You can learn more about our work and other Chamber Foundation programs at uschamberfoundation.org. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day.